right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 15 of Bullish. Thanks for joining us. We're going to start with the fun stuff first here. Remember, anything we discuss, not individual stock advice, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Stanger Family Office and its clients may hold positions in some of the stocks discussed. For a full disclosure, visit StangerFamilyOffice.com. You know the regular crew. I'm Sam Hardy. We've got Nick Stanger. We have producer Owen in the back. We are Stanger Family Office. For the past 43 years, it has been our mission to deliver both clarity and confidence to help secure your financial future. Nick's going to do uh, a quick introduction here in a second, but I have to say we're unbelievably excited to have Dave McGarrell of First Trust joining us today. He's our first live guest here in the newly improved studio. So Nick, take it away. Welcome, Dave. Dave, I don't know about um, you, but these glasses are very dark. I can tell they yeah. are. Oh, you guys look fantastic in those places. I can't I can't tell how to look at you if I need to like look I up or just pretend light. like I can't see you right now. I, I think the lights are pretty strong but the sun I think will be stronger today. Dave, I don't know if you know this but you're not supposed to look directly into the sun later this afternoon. Yes, I've been told many many times. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many times have you been told Nick? Uh my my dad made a point many times to make sure that ba baby Jack, my son, would have his glasses on. I go, I don't think that's going to happen, but <laughs> hopefully he'll be safely inside somewhere. So Dave McGarrow, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being on. Dave is Chief Investment Officer, Chief Operating Officer. He's a Managing Director at First Trust Portfolios, an asset manager based in Wheaton, Illinois, with over $210 billion with a B. That's right, 210 with a B in assets under management. As First Trust Chief Investment Officer, Dave leads the First Trust Investment Committee. He guides the general investment philosophy at the firm as well. Dave has over 20 years of experience and is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Is it 20 or is it 30 now? This might be an old bio. It's, uh, well, 1988 grad, so that's a long time ago, and about 30 years, um, 27 years of first trust, and then as a CPA for eight years prior to that, so. So Dave is, a C career. Dave is a CPA as well. He went to University of Notre Dame where he earned his degree in accounting. He's also a member of the AICPA, is that correct? That's correct. So Dave, thank you so much for being on. Um, you guys, we were talking before the show started here. You have nailed multiple calls over the years. Um, let's start with energy. Sure. We, we have been bullish on energy. It's been an allocation, an over-allocation in our models uh, for quite a while now. It's a pretty simple process. You have a very cheap basket of stocks. You have um, the same or increasing uh, demand. Demand is expected um, to go up about eight to 10% over the next decade, even as there's a transition worldwide to other uses, other other forms of um, energy use other than fossil fuels. But it is a transition, it's a slow transition, and there has been uh, very little investment in the energy space. Uh, the S&P 500 at one point during COVID was reduced to being less than 2% of the entire market cap of the S&P 500 because energy stocks were battered so uh, so much, and they've been a clear leader here since uh, the bottoming in the COVID. And, uh, and again, this year are one of the two best sectors. It might be the best sector as we sit here today on top of communication services and even better than technology this year, up maybe 15, 16% for the energy space. How did you guys make that call with so many people going bearish on energy, saying we're going to be on solar farms and and wind panels or what are wind farms and solar panels? How did you guys make that contrarian call? Yeah, it's just it's just math. If you just look and, and you look at how much we use fossil fuels, not just driving our cars or flying our airplanes, but in every walk of life, uh, heating our houses and in so many different products, um, it, it's obvious that we're going to need. Um, fossil fuels for a very, very long time. On top of it, you had the rest of the world, especially Europe, doing things that made no economic sense. Um, and that the, the amount of supply is not going to grow unless you invest. And so the Exxons of the world and the Chevrons of the world and all the small E&Ps uh, tremen tremendously benefited from uh, the lack of investment going on in the rest of the world. Now you're starting to see some of those companies, Shell and BP, starting to articulate more of a transition versus trying to get there overnight. And and that just begot higher prices, uh, demand not shrinking, coming back from COVID. And um, we're going to see prices here or above or in this range for quite a long time. 
on top of it, the companies, because of the massive profitability the last several years, have been able to compare their balance sheets to a position that they've never seen before. So now they're starting to do stock buybacks, increasing dividends, special dividends, and still being able to invest capital to find new resources. So uh, energy is in, in a very uh, good spot. It's about 4%, 4.5% of the S&P 500. But for the last three years, it's actually earned a lot more than 4.5% of the profits of the index. So when you're hitting above your weight on profits and you traded low uh, teens or even single digit multiples, uh, it's an attractive proposition. Do you think energy is topping out here with oil rising? Is it any? Is there anything in the energy market going on that you think points to recession on the time horizon? You know, next year, eighteen months from now. Yeah, the real concern with energy is if we do have a recession and the demand weakens significantly, um, and, and that's where you have to keep your eye out. It's kind of like that in every space on the cyclical side. However, if we have a recession, um, you're going to see all the cyclicals start to get hit. And then you're going to see the Fed act, obviously, uh, if, if that does happen. But that is the real threat. If we do have a recession, that energy typically falls quite uh, dramatically uh, in a recessionary environment. So that's what we have our eye on as far as whether or not we want to be overweight or underweight. And as we sit here today, with GDP coming in above 2% quarter after quarter after quarter, and unemployment not really ticking much higher, um, the threat of a recession today um, just it's really hard to find any signs of that. Do commodities and gold prices rising at the same time as energy, does that also kind of lead to a recessionary indicator at some point? It could. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to um, to surmise why gold is rising. You would expect that might be some of it, a threat of a recession, but it could simply be um, the massive deficits that were running at the municipal and federal level and the fear of fiat currencies um, being basically, you know, inflated uh, because of so much money printing and 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 again deficit uh, deficit um, running deficits across the economy. So I think that's a, a big part of it um, of gold rise and commodity rise is hard goods in in an inflation environment that has frankly we accelerated a tiny bit this year. Um, as the Fed got it to 3%, now it's it's kind of hanging around there and, and increasing a little bit from there. So I think that threat of less rate cuts coming forward and higher prices for longer would keep rates higher and also um, benefit those who do own hard goods. What are your thoughts on, and I know First Trust was on the cutting edge of not calling inflation transitory, which was the opposite of the Honorable Jerome Powell at the time and Janet Yellen, quite frankly. I mean, how did you guys make that call? What what led you guys to come out? I think it was 2021 when First Trust came out with the call and said, hey, inflation's here to stay. Yeah, that's really our, our chief economist, Brian Westbury, and his team looking at all the data and seeing the kind of money printing that was going on and that kind of um, monetary stimulus. And and on top of the fiscal stimulus and saying that you cannot uh, do this, you cannot print that much money, you cannot add that much to the money supply um, and not have inflation. And he was exactly right uh, that we, we had massive inflation, even as it ebbs here at three, three percent or so, um, higher than the Fed wants, higher than anybody wants. Um, so it's still not eradicated. And um, e even with the Fed raising rates dramatically. Um, I have a thesis for that, and I think it's simply the fiscal stimulus. There is so much fiscal stimulus that is actually thwarting the Fed in some regards from actually seeing uh, inflation uh, go to the 2% level because every time the, the, the rates might affect somebody, fiscally, the government is just giving citizens and companies more and more money and we're running a, almost a $2 trillion deficit this year in, in a time when we're not at work. So it's, um, I think the fiscal response is still continuing with the infrastructure bill and, and, and lots of uh, other government support that's superseding some of what the Fed's trying to do in, in regards to inflation. So where do you think rates go from here? Are, are you in the higher for longer camp? Are you in a lot higher for longer? Do you think rates go up, go down? What What are you guys looking at? I'm certainly in the higher for longer. I think the Fed actually is in a decent position today. Uh, there have 
They raised rates eight times in, in 2022 from May through December. They raised four times in the first half, including July of 2023. Um, they haven't done anything since July. It's mm -hmm. we're coming on a year, 10 months now. They haven't raised or cut rates. And um, But think about what they raised from. They raised from zero to five and a half. That's 550%. If they cut 50 basis points, that's less than a 10% cut on rates. They have a lot of ammunition that they haven't had in a very long time to cut. So if we do see signs of a recession, why would the Fed not cut? They could cut 100 basis points. They would still be at 4.5% on an overnight rate, which is higher than we've been in the last 15 years, uh, frankly. So they have a lot of uh, ability if interest rates work as they should, to go ahead and spur economic activity if we do start slowing down or see an uptick in unemployment. Uh, even at 3% inflation, if you divide it across the course of a year, we're already a quarter in, a little bit more than a quarter. Even with the election on the threshold, the, the Fed can handle inflation at three, three and a quarter here for the rest of this year through the election, and then maybe decide what they want to do from there. But they have the ability to cut, which is going to be beneficial to the economy. So that's where they haven't been in a long, long time, having a lot of firepower. Um, maybe we don't have the same firepower fiscally, but certainly monetary wise, they have 550 base points to get to zero. But do you credit the Fed? Like, do you give the Fed credit for, oh, we're having a slowdown in inflation, or do you say, hey, it's just the economy naturally here slowing down a little bit, money supply burning off? Because I think a lot of the Fed's problem here is like, look at Apple. They're sitting on, what, $100 billion in cash, making 5% risk-free. Warren Buffett's doing the same thing at Berkshire. Wealthy families are sitting on cash with no debt. They could buy whatever they want and not have to finance. It's not like the Fed has really slowed a lot of these people down. Do you think there's a world where if the Fed cuts, it's almost going to feel like tightening to people? Oh, uh, well, I don't know if it's going to feel like tightening, but I do feel um, the Fed was able to to fix their mistake by at least acknowledging that, okay, we made a mistake, inflation is here, and they did raise rates dramatically, 475 base point rate hikes, not on the table at all when we started in uh, 2022, and, and they did that rapidly in the second half of, of that year in 2022. And uh, and they got it to a point where at least inflation is not increasing at the rate that it had been, obviously. So do I give them credit for recognizing their mistake? Is that a nice way to say it? Uh, to some extent, yes. Um, I think the other thing they benefited from, of course, again, is that fiscal response that is continual and, and doesn't seem to go away. And then just the construction of... Um, the U.S. economy, we many of us have low mortgage mortgages, two and a half, three percent. If you have any cash, you can have it risk free at five point three percent today. So, the rest of the world doesn't have fixed mortgages. We do. So that is a massive benefit. Where even people with debt have such a low rate that any cash they take in actually can out earn that debt, uh, and, and the, the the debt costs. Um, and that is highly unusual. And I think that is also supporting, you know, the, the economy today. So in, in a way, they got a little bit lucky. Um, but the luck is because we're, you know, hurting future generations by spending so much money uh, today. Uh, and the only way to pay it back is to raise taxes. And the threat of higher rates on government debt in the future is it's certainly real in my mind. So rate hikes are supposed to kind of slow down the growth train a little bit. And you saw that IPO market in 2021 pick up. We call it high octane growth. You've talked about MAG7. I guess it's the Fab Four now is what they're calling it. But it hasn't really slowed down. Is it all just expectation based? Is, is the whole MAG7, the Fab Four, whatever you want to call it, that trade this year and last year, is that all based on the expectation that rates are going to get cut? I think that's some of it. I think the, the response fiscally and just again the, the how massive it was and coming from a spot where we have have had just good news in a rising stock market uh, has still kept us in um, a situation where the allocation of capital is still um, lacks a, a significant regard for risk 
and we tend to chase. So we have a lot of crowded trades. We have a lot of speculation in the market. And then there's just um, this idea that certain companies, um, I'll pick on Tesla here because they're in the news. Tesla really hasn't had any good news in the last 16 months, 15 months, whatever it is. Uh, they had a horrific number last uh, uh, week, which articulated that their sales were weaker than anybody had forecast, much weaker and significantly lower than where they were a month ago. And the stock fell into the low 160s or so. And then as soon as it it couldn't get a bid, Elon Musk basically tweeted that, hey, we're going to do a presentation on robo-taxis on August 8th. And today, the stock is up $10. It's well above where it was uh, when they announced that they couldn't sell enough cars and that their forecast for selling cars in the future were not going to be met and that the only response is to cut prices heavily. And now this hope, this idea that in August, they're going to make a presentation. They're not going to have robo-taxis to pick you up at O'Hare Airport um, has now added, you know, a massive amount of billions and billions of dollars of their market cap um, without anybody knowing what the announcement is even going to be. So there's this chasing, there's, there's, there's the, again, a lack of regard for risk. And um, there's been a lot of articles on that you know, associated with gambling a little bit or whatever. So I think we still have that genre of investor who, who says, if you just hold in there and buy every time it dips, you, you're going to be a winner. And the market is going to eradicate that. I don't know when, but the speculative trade that is just momentum based without fundamentals um, will will go down, and then for the in the tenth time when people put money into that trade, then it will get crushed, and when it gets crushed, that will kind of stop the um, speculative speculation where there's no fundamentals attached to it. I'm not saying that's the case with Tesla, but there's a lot of hope in that stock price about future things that don't have any really good evidence other than the genius of Elon Musk. Yeah. And the stock's already down, what, 55% from the all-time high. It's down 30% this year, but could yeah. have a lot further to fall before it catches the bottom. It was sure. the only one in that group that had seen a, a negative year-to-date number this year. And I think yeah, it was up three and a half, four percent 4%. And EVs across the board, maybe uh, it, it sounds like you're saying Tesla specific, but EVs across the board have kind of taken a hit as well. You've had what Mercedes, Audi, and a number of these other companies who are saying, hey, we're going full green EV only by 2030, 2035 are now rolling that back. And the hybrid play is kind of what people are going for. My my favorite thing of all time is on Ogden Avenue here. There's an old Hummer dealership. Literally, it has the H on the front still. And in the middle, it says Tesla now. So it's, now it's a new Tesla dealer. That's the funniest thing that's happened oh, in the yeah. past 20 years. I've been to that one a couple of times. You could not have two more opposite companies in that same yeah. building. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a long transition, just like the fossil fuel, the EV story is long dated. Anybody who's buying a combustion engine today probably is going to be holding that car in 2035 or six years. Um, so none of them are going to be off the road. We're going, to, we're going to see that a much slower track, in my view, on EVs than anybody articulated several years ago. Sam, you want to talk Mag 7 here? Yeah, I had just, and I know Dave, you've talked about this on a on a number of different uh, cases, but this is just a good chart. It kind of shows the weighting. This is just the top five firms, but the weighting it's currently holding in the S and P five hundred. Maybe just kind of share your thoughts on the significance of that. And I've got a another one too that we can get to as well. Um, just talking about the overall kind of performance um, and and the the, I guess the weighting it it carries as far as performance in the S and P goes. Sure. So we all know the MAG-7. Here's five of them uh, on the screen in front of us from Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon, and Alphabet, five of the best companies in the world, if not the five best companies in the world. They're fantastic companies. They're all, I think every single one of those is north of a trillion dollars in equity market cap uh, with NVIDIA over like 2.3 trillion today. Amazon's right on top of it. And and then you have Google there. You don't even have Meta on there, which has had a spectacular year last year. At one level, just a practical consideration crosses your mind. Microsoft is a $3 trillion company. Apple is almost the same. Uh, again, those five names make up 25% of a $44 billion trillion index. So 500 companies. The best 
the biggest, baddest index in the world of companies. I mean, you name a company in the top 100 in the S&P 500, you probably have a sector or industry leader in the entire world. Uh, nobody makes Indians like GE, uh, you, you, Johnson & Johnson, JP Morgan's the best bank in the world, Exxon's the best energy company in the world. And those companies are all in that top 100. Um, so across the board, we have uh, these leaders in the entire index, yet 25% of the total value is just in those five names on your screen. And when you do get to levels of say $3 trillion market cap, which we've never seen before, just simple math says to you, if how do I double my money in this name? Well, it becomes worth $6 trillion. Well, to add another $3 trillion of market cap and to trade at 20 times earnings, you need to add another $150 billion of profits. And that's a very tall task because nobody at this point in time makes $150 worth of profits. Um, Apple makes about $100 billion or so. Um, but you start looking at the math and the only reason to trade at that kind of multiple is if you have growth on top of um, those kind of numbers. So you say, where can I make uh, outsized returns? And it gets really hard to do the math and say, um, I'm going to make outsized returns in names that are this, bi this big at this point in time. So what they do is they're buying back a ton of stock, every single one of those companies now, uh, maybe Epson, NVIDIA, to help goose the earnings per share significantly. They are cash cows, they're great companies, but the growth of those companies is difficult. Apple is the best example right now. Apple can't grow. They didn't invest uh, significantly. They didn't buy any companies. They bought Beats for $5 billion, about the only company they really bought. Why Why aren't they buying anyone? You know, the, the, they basically did just a financial look at their business. And they said, we should trade at a higher multiple. We can't grow earnings as fast as we would like. So they bought about 40% almost of the shares back. So if you look at Apple over the last 10, 12 years, they've doubled their, their earnings from about in the mid 40s to about $100 billion of earnings. But their share count uh, shrunk so much that their earnings per share went from about $1.50 10 or 12 years ago to about $6 today. So they goosed the earnings per share. Great for shareholders, nothing wrong with it. I applaud Apple, but they didn't invest for the future. They weren't they didn't have an AI team where they did spend their money was on the Apple car and they just shut it down because they couldn't make it work. Yeah. Uh, put a lot of money into that, but otherwise their R and D spend has been pretty negligent for growing. So I, I used to say, look, Tim Cook came in and what he's done for shareholders is just dramatic, but, but Cook is an operator. Steve Jobs was an innovator and what Apple needs today is an innovator. So you're right. Nick, they're probably going to go try to buy their way into AI. Um, everybody talks about AI today because if you didn't have a strategy, you better get one, or, or you'll you know, in the stock market will take care of take care of your multiple. And so they're going to have all kinds of AI talk, but I don't know what their solution is at this point. Uh, they did some sort of partnership with Google, so we'll, we'll see what they have um, going forward. But they're just behind in innovating and finding new sources of revenue. Is there? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say lots of comparisons for this basket of stocks specifically are being made to the dot-com bubble. Certain individuals are saying this is more like an earlier stage in that, the 1995 moment. Some others are saying we're closer to that late 90s, early 2000s kind of peak. What are your thoughts? And this this chart kind of speaks to that to some extent in how how valuable these companies are and the importance of them. Sure. It's certainly high, although you can see it, it has been relatively, you know, in, in that above that 50% range for 10% of the stocks uh, f for a long time. So I don't think we're in the late 1990s at all. I thought in 2021, uh, with all those thousand IPOs that we had a lot of speculation and we had a lot of companies that were like pets.com or some of the names back then. My Peloton is currently a coat rack in our basement. Yes. Yeah. Peloton is a good one. Exactly. Um, but we had a lot of companies that, that were actually worse than Peloton and went public. And they're all small cap companies now. Most of them are mid cap companies. They've come down from 60, 70, 80, 90, a hundred billion dollar market caps to uh, be back priced as hope stocks, if you will. Uh, they've gotten a bid here in the speculative market, but I don't think we actually have a valuation issue 
uh, like we did have back in, in, in 1999. Cisco became worth $500 billion once we got through the Y2K and into March of, uh, of 2000. And what's interesting is that stock, I think it was probably $75 in March of 2000, at the end of March. And then it started to fall and it came all, it came back to about $68 in August. So even as things were fading, uh, it was hanging in there. People couldn't give it up. They're like, no, no, Cisco is money good. You got to buy it every time it falls. And then by March of 21, it was about a $15 stock and it was just gone. And it's still not back even close to where it was back then. 25 years later. 25 years later, exactly. So we do not have that here with these companies and their makeup because they are cash cows. Apple makes an enormous amount of money. Microsoft has embedded um, sustainable revenue um, that that they're not going to lose money. They're not going to really struggle. Uh, their multiple might have to come way down if they did struggle and have a period of oh, low and no growth. But, but I don't think we're in that same spot. Having said that, the opportunity clearly is somewhere if everybody's crowded into the same space and you look at that space and you say, oh, it trades at 32, 35, 31 times earnings. Like what trades uh, at a better multiple where I can find some growth? And actually that's what you're going to see as we move through this year is the growth being much less concentrated in earnings than what we have seen, especially in 2023. Is, is there a world where valuation stays stretched for a while simply because you have all this money that you can't invest in China anymore? China's uninvestable. I think a lot of us would agree on that, or at least a lot of the companies over there. You know, Europe's tough, been a disaster, like you've said, right? Japan, take out the currency, has been a disaster. So could valuations stay where they're at just because you have all this demand for US equities? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, the, the 50 year average on. Uh, PE multiple for the S&P 500 is uh, 16 and a half. The 25 year average is 18.3. So the last 25 years is higher. I think that's fair because of the type of businesses. They're not, um, we don't need to build new factories to increase revenue when you have a software company or pharmaceutical company. So many businesses have better margins and better growth prospects that are, that are you can grow for a lot, uh, a longer period of time um, because of the lack of capital that you need to grow that business. So I think a higher multiple is justified today. You can have valuation stay high much longer. Um, like if you're shorting stocks, then you can possibly stay solvent. And the late 90s showed you that. Uh, and Alan Greenspan said in 1996, um, he mentioned the terms irrational exuberance, equities uh, exhibit signs of irrational exuberance. And then we had 1997, 1998, 1999, all the way into March of 2000, where the stock market went bananas and continued to climb long after he told investors, be careful here. So that's three years and three months where the market did nothing but go higher. So, so we can stay there for a long time, but eventually you're going to see fundamentals, something you, you need to spark a trigger for that. Um, I think what we have today is is an investor base primarily that understands that because we did experience that. We experienced 08, 09 and the debt crisis and what debt can do to equity holdings. Uh, so we have some information out there in, in sober-minded investors, which are most of, most investors, there's the speculative element, but um, they kind of go away when the market doesn't go straight up. And, and so I think this pivot that we're going to see from these names is, is real as we move through this year because it is supported by um, earnings growth being much more dispersed than it's been and valuations being still very dispersed. That top 10% of stocks is heavily weighted, but more importantly, it's, it's heavily priced. And, and so that's where the highest valuations are. They deserve some of that because of the strength of their balance sheets and their business models and their return on on, on equity. Uh, but it's too wide today in light of what we're seeing when it comes to earnings as we move forward. Well, it seems like the late 90s where it was really a valuation story. Earnings were stagnating. Valuations were, is where you got all your return. Sam's got a chart up here too that you guys put out about earnings growth 
this time around, yes, we've gotten some multiple expansion, but it does look like earnings are going up. I mean, where, where do you guys see earnings here? Yeah, so there, there's the earnings profile. The, the real key that I would focus on is 2025. We're already into April of 24. Uh, to go from 220 to 244 or 245, um, basically the numbers haven't haven't changed. And that's kind of interesting, right? The earnings picture hasn't changed from the beginning of the year yet, at least not substantially. I guess if you go out to 2026, you get a little bit of a, a higher number. Uh, yet the market's up 10% in, in, in the first quarter. So why did that happen? Oil prices are higher. Rates haven't come down. The 10-year went from 388 to 440 today, and yet stocks are up 10%. So the, to, to me, there's more risk in the market today than there was when we started the year. We're 10% higher. We've The highest forecast of 19 analysts that we follow was 5,200. When I walked in here today, we were 5,206. It's April 8th. Mm-hmm. So we're already past that that high forecast, yet the earnings haven't budged at all. But what's most important is if you look at the earnings <clears throat> expectations for this year, when reports come out for the first quarter, it's still going to favor big tech companies. A lot of this has to do with Meta and Amazon. What happened with Meta and Amazon is they had horrific 2022s, you know, Zuckerberg and, and Meta were trying to do the metaverse. They hired thousands of engineers. They they spent an enormous amount of money and it affected their earnings. Their earnings fell about 40% from 2021 to 22. Amazon was building factories in one uh, earnings release. They, they said the cost of steel for a reason why they were going to miss their earnings forecast. Amazon actually earned about over $30 billion in 2021. In 2022, they lost money. They actually lost money in 2022. So what happened in 23 is both of them got religion. They said, our shareholders are going to lynch us. We got to make sure we, uh, we, we, we cut costs and do what we should be doing, which is selling goods and, uh, and doing everything that we do over at Meta. And Meta came back and earned a little bit more than they did in 2022. So they went from, I'll make some numbers up here, say $14 to $8 to $15, one year one, two, three. So they got it all back and their stock went bananas last year. Said, okay, Meta's back. And then Amazon went from 30 billion to zero to $30 billion last year. So they got it all back. So they had really easy comparisons to the prior year when you go from zero to 30. So that's enormous earnings growth. And that contributed to last year's earnings actually being flat or down just a little bit from the prior year. This year, in the first quarter, those earnings are still intact with really easy comparisons. The rest of the market actually was not growing during during that period of time in 2023. The, those two companies basically saved, and, and Microsoft and those companies saved the S&P from having a worse earnings picture. But as we go through this year, starting in the second quarter, the rate of decline of earnings for the MAG-7 is, it's declining. It's not r- rising. And the rate of change in the rest of the S&P 500, the other 493 names, is actually going higher. So when you when you start looking at that, by the fourth quarter, the 493 and the, the MAG-7 are expected to have the same exact earnings growth. It couldn't have been more widespread last year and even in this first quarter about to be reported. But that's about to change significantly. The market at the end of this quarter, as earnings get reported, is going to look forward and say, well, wait a minute, I can buy the same kind of growth for half the multiple by the time we get to the fourth quarter. And we think investors are going to skate ahead to that and say, that's why I want to be positioned as things come in. And there's a lot of other good reasons. If rates do get cut, do you want to, you want to own companies that pay dividends? because we're going to have to replace that income that we can get for free in the fixed income space today uh, without taking much risk in quality dividend paying stocks. So there, there's a real good reason to, to say widen and broaden your portfolio today uh, and, and don't just get captured by where the crowd is in those seven big stocks. Isn't market breadth too, like a, it's a bullish sign for the market long, long run, right? The, the earnings widening out and 
Oh, no question. I mean, for the economy, for, for the market itself. I mean, if you're seeing profitability uh, across the S&P 500, it gives everybody an opportunity to uh, to to reinvest in their company. And, and that's what you're seeing, that, that profit that Sam just showed uh, was so dramatic. It's light years above where we were just several years ago. And the best profits in S&P 500 history was $161 in 2019. We're only in 2024. And yet last year we did 220. This year, the expectation for 244, 245. That's so much extra profits in that basket of 500 stocks that allows you to pay down some debt with rates being higher, increase your dividend. What's happening across the board are massive stock buybacks. Every single company, it seems, is announcing they're going to buy back stock when they announce their profits uh, on a quarterly basis. And then this index right here, we said one simple thing when we started this year, looking at the number of companies that outperform the S&P 500 uh, on an annual basis that do better than what the index does. And last year was the most narrow year since at least 1995. You could see in 1998 and 1999, 29%, only 31%. Uh, and then during the COVID year, 33%, kind of understandable. A lot of businesses couldn't really operate. Um, so you wanted to invest in only the ones that that could survive COVID, social media companies, tech companies. But last year was only 27%. That was so narrow. So we said, do we expect 2024 to be more or less narrow of companies that can outperform the index? Well, I don't know how you can look at that chart and, and, and guess that it's going to be uh, more narrow than it was last year. It's the most narrow since 1995. And more interestingly, look what happens after you get really narrow stock market performance in, in 2000, 01, 02, 03, 63, 67, 61% of the companies outperform the index that year. You clearly don't want to just own what you owned in 1998 or 1999. You want a whole breadth of companies that can outperform the index. And something similar happened in, in 21 and 22. And so we would expect that to happen this year. Now in January, it didn't happen. Only 27% of the companies outperformed. But by the end of February, 34% of the companies were outperforming. And by the end of March, 40% of companies in the S&P 500 are outperforming. The 30-year the average there is about 45% uh, of the time, uh, 45% of the companies outperform on an annual basis. So we think the market's going to get wider here as we move forward uh, with or without rate cuts. And, and you're going to benefit as an investor if you own a lot more than just seven companies or just that tech plus trade that's out there. So do you think 276 in earnings on the S&P for next year is still on the table then? 276 is, is high. I think if we look back, I think that number was, uh, I guess it is 276 for 2025. We have a number um, from the beginning of the year. Maybe we were using a different forecast at 268. 275 is a big number. That's 13% growth. That's faster than normal. It will depend on basically a soft landing or a no landing. That, that's a that's a really good number. So at 5,500 divided by 275, I'm doing the math right, that's 20 times. What are we, 52? It still doesn't leave you a, a, a ton of room in the index um, based upon that number. I, I'll say this, it, we better see earnings continue to move higher um, if, if we're going to maintain these kind of multiples because you do need average or above average earnings growth to trade the market at 20, 21 times. The caveat is if you get wider than just the, the top 10 names, um, you get a much better valuation story and maybe can sustain slower growth than 11 and 13% over the next couple of years. So if the Fed cuts, I mean, does that exuberance kind of come back to the market then? Do you start to see some of the speculation come back? Do you start to see the growth stocks take back off, the MAG-7 included in that? it's possible. I would be a little bit surprised. We've already extended valuations on those quite significantly. And my guess is that they will cut and articulate continued cuts only on the sign of some weakness, which will probably show up in that profitability story. So I'm not sure that we're just going to redo the speculative phase of what we've seen uh, over the last several years um, if the Fed were to cut. Because again, we're not cutting from even during COVID, I think they started at two and a half. They cut to 175 and they got rid of all of it, you know, six weeks later or a couple of weeks later. 
So they were at a much lower base where they had been trying to raise rates in the 2019 um, instead of instead of raising rates like they said they were going to do it. They, they actually cut rates that year. Um, so I, I don't think it'll lead to a real speculative trade there because there there has to be some effect of this the, the, this tightening. And we, it just hasn't shown up. So long and variable lags, maybe longer because of the fiscal response, but eventually higher rates uh, make capital more dear, make people more more reluctant to part with their capital unless they're getting a fair return and, and, and reduce the speculation. I don't think 100 base points of cuts changes that significantly. Dave, if you can, please, for our next segment here, look into the crystal ball. <laughs> For everybody at home, we do have a crystal ball here on the table. Got it from Amazon.com. So it doesn't work that well. Uh, hasn't really told us much in the past. But if you can, look into the crystal ball. Tell us maybe where you see some opportunity here for the rest of 24 and maybe even next year. Sure. I, I think there's uh, still lots of opportunity. I don't think it rests totally on a Fed cut, but the direction of a cut is imperative. It has to be a cut next whether that's in the first, or second, third, fourth, next year, first quarter, whatever it might be. But eliminate the threat of inflation not going away and the Fed having to raise rates. Raising rates, I think, will really harm this market and crush this market. Um, so the opportunity with, with the Fed sitting there ready to cut is where do you have good valuation? Where do you have increasing earnings? Where do, you, where do you have increasing dividends? Where do you have companies that trade significantly lower than 20, 21 times in the, in the market? And where can you get quality without paying too much for that quality? Quality has been a, a fantastic factor. Momentum's the best this year, of course. But March was pretty interesting because the value factor uh, started to work better. The size factor started to work a little bit better. So you have tremendous valuation gaps in small cap stocks. You have a ridiculous valuation gap in Europe versus the U.S. international. Um, if those just close based upon um, the idea that we're going to have a, a softer landing, that the Fed will cut rates a couple of times uh, this year, maybe a couple of times next year if they need to, the opportunity, I think, is just much more widespread between U.S. cyclicals. I think defensive actually look okay and not a bad idea with, uh, I would say, uh, there's definitely risk in the market at, at these kind of valuation levels. So I think you just want to be really broad. And then you want to use the fixed income rates today to your advantage. You want some fixed income in your portfolio, uh, especially for certain clients um, who, who who want that stability uh, but you want to extend some of that. You want to make sure you can capture that uh, while rates are still where they are. Um, and again, some sort of a barbell where if you're wrong on rates and they do end up going higher um, or they get come down much faster that you have some duration um, kind of in the mid, and I'm not talking 20, 30 year duration, but something um, that, that, that can keep you, those rates uh, for your clients higher for longer. Sam, you want to roll through some of these charts quickly, just some of the stuff that Dave and, and his team have put together? Yeah, this one just specifically goes into small and mid caps. You mentioned the the gap between those and, and large caps and the opportunity set that's potentially there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, small caps typically have traded at a parity or above large caps because of uh, faster earnings growth historically. That uh, is now at, at a pretty big discount. The last time it was at this kind of discount was in the late 90s. That was a mega cap large trade as well. And the idea was that these companies have an inherent advantage. We hear the same thing today. And yet, if you look past um, 99 and 2000, what you saw was small caps doing really well. They can, they're more nimble. Like, look, capital is harder to get for them. Interest rates matter a little bit more. They're going to benefit from interest rate cuts, no question about it. But they also benefit from a lot of the, secular changes in society and they can get bigger faster as well from that small cap status big companies in the past that where you where you just needed capital it was really hard to get bigger faster because of, because of the lack of, of being able to attain that capital reasonable price so so we like the small cap idea of course if we get a tough recession you don't want to be in that space 
you know, big overweight, but, uh, but the valuation is about the only place where you see remnants of, hey, there could be a recession here. So I think it's a pretty good bet to to make sure you own some small mid cap stocks. Yeah, and there may be a catch up. the The other one that we wanted to talk as well is just foreign. Obviously, the past decade it hasn't been the best place to be compared to the U.S. A dumpster um, fire. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So d- don't know if you have any thoughts there. Just on, uh, I know you mentioned maybe a potential overweight on the small mid cap side of things. Um, do you feel similarly on the international piece of it? Just because they have lagged so much this past decade. I do. They have lagged tremendously, and it shows up in the valuation story of the of the U.S. versus the rest of the world. Um, typically, about fifteen to eighteen percent discount to to our uh, stock market, and today it's in the in the high thirty percent discounts. Um, when you, when you look at forward multiples, they're definitely more cyclical and defensive than us. We have all the great technology companies. Maybe that should be wider than it has been. Uh, historically, maybe it should be in the low twenties, but it shouldn't be almost forty percent discount to companies um, in the UK and in France and a bunch of these other uh, countries that have really good companies, quality companies, uh, and I think that's going to narrow. I hope it narrows by them doing well um, because we've started to put more into international and uh, and as an opportunity. And you have some good quality companies over there trading at tremendous discounts. So it's a way to play the cyclical defensive value trade um, with without in a better valuation state than even the U.S. today. So so we do like international going forward. But yes. aren't aren't a lot of these international companies cheap for a reason? That is true. They have been slow, slow, even their banks to recover from 08, 09. It's just astonishing how long it took them. But you're starting to see, if not green shoots, you're starting to see at least on the rhetoric side and some of the actions, um, companies saying, enough, our job is to make money for our investors. You see that from the oil companies? They were going green and now they're saying, now it's a transition and we need to make money. Shell had designs on being the biggest energy company in the world uh, today. We're going to beat Exxon. Here's how we're going to do it. And they're about half the size of Exxon today. And Shell's team now is saying, we're going to get fossil fuels out of the ground. We're going to still try to be green, but this is going to be a long time. In the meantime, we're going to try to make a lot of money for shareholders. And you see BP saying the same thing. You see the banks over there starting to say, okay, how do we grow this thing? The UBSs of the world. So you, you see you see some signs of Europe saying, you know, enough with, you know, all of our talk about how we're going to change the world and let's do what we're supposed to do at the company level. And then over time, we'll take care of everything else. So uh, I, I think you're right. Some are cheap for a reason, but there, there's some value there for sure. Yeah. The joke at Shell is work at Shell, but buy Exxon stock. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that would have been a good uh, strategy the last 10 years. Yeah. No doubt about it. And then this this last one's just looking at individual sectors and maybe you could, I know you've touched on it some, but some of the areas you're seeing opportunity there, I know we're heading into an earnings season as well. We've got a lot of financials next week, some of the mega caps at the end of the, at the end of the month. So maybe just some of the opportunities you're, you're looking for here. I know energy is one we've touched a lot. Sure. I mean, you can just look at year to date numbers and you can see, again, technology is up 12.7%, but without NVIDIA, it would be middle of the pack. And if it is up 77%, it's a huge weight in that sector, I think 14 or 15% perhaps. So that one single name, um, and what's important to remember is it is a spectacular company. Their earnings were astonishing. But that, that single stock risk right there, and it, it performed, same thing with communication services. There's four companies in there. That's the best sector year to date. It's led by Meta and Google. They're more than half that index. And then Netflix and Disney are about 13, 14% combined. All four of those stocks make up 80% of that entire index. They've all had a spectacular year. Uh, Meta the best, I think. And it's up 15.8%. So again, you got some narrow leadership in the the, 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 the big growth stories in tech and, and services. But then you look at energy, and Exxon and Chevron are big companies, but you also have ConocoPhillips and the Halliburton's of the world. And you go through that financial, JP Morgan is a big footprint, but Citi is a big company. Wells Fargo is a big company, Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs and on and on. And, and that sector is up 12 and a half percent. 
almost exactly the same as technology. Industrials, GE uh, is there, but nowhere near the footprint that a Meta has in services or an Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA have in, um, in information technology. So you can find um, this broadening out right on that screen in that first year to day column. Uh, even utilities have started to get a bid, you know, with the defensive posturing. And the simple reason is the expectation is still the Fed will cut rates. So then you'll want some low volatile um, dividend yielding uh, stocks. But also we finally reset valuation on defensives. There's been such a lack of interest in that space that instead of paying above average multiple because you couldn't get income anywhere, we're now paying a multiple much more historically in line with where utilities trade or, or healthcare companies or consumer staples. And, and you're seeing the market say, okay, I, I can own these now. And if rates do get cut, these are going to respond pretty good. And if we do have a recession, these are now positioned uh, where um, they should hold up better than the rest of the market because they are defensive. Dave, let's close on, I think this is a quote you said at a, a speech a couple years ago, and I love this quote. You said, I think this was you, technology has never moved this fast, but at the same time, it'll never move this slow again. Talk about where you see U.S. economy going forward. I know you're an optimist. Tell people why you're still optimistic. Sure. That is a fantastic quote, and that is courtesy of Brian Westbury. And when I'm asked about um, so many parts of technology uh, on the equity basis, uh, I love to cite Brian's quote there because it's so true. I mean, every single day of our lives, technology infects us. Sometimes it's slow moving and we don't notice it, but it's helpful. Uh, it was helpful today for me when I uh, I couldn't find the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I looked at my phone. I said, okay, there it is over there. Why is it on that side of the street? I don't know, but that's where it is. So, um, so every single day you're going to see technology uh, improve our lives. And I am an optimist. Uh, the one, you know, obviously the, the debt and the deficit are to me tragic because it's all self-inflicted wounds. We don't need to spend this insane amount of money um, for our society to help people who need help and to secure our country and to, to make sure our economy is competitive with the rest of the world. Um, but that also means it's fixable. All we need is the right leadership. I would attest we haven't had it in, in a long time and many, many levels, uh, not just currently um, at the municipal and at the, at the federal level. And eventually um, things get bad enough, people get fed up enough that there's a response and somebody or a group of people get in there uh, and the mandate is followed that we want a better lives for our kids than um, what it looks like if we continue what we're doing right now. And when that resonates and it can spread, and when it spreads, I think it, it, it'll be beneficial. Regardless, um, to give a quote from somebody else, Warren Buffett, and I can't remember exact quote, but if you're going to bet against America, you, uh, you're making a big mistake. And when America's at a discount or great companies are available, um, you should buy those and tuck them under your pillow and own them forever because you're going to, you're going to do really well because um, there's people who question American ingenuity, work ethic, um, all kinds of things. And they've always been wrong and then they'll be wrong again. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely long-term bullish and whatever happens in the next year or two with the stock market and the economy, um, we'll find our way through like we always do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks for being on the podcast today. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening, follow Dave. Do you have a TikTok? Or are you on TikTok, Dave? I am not on TikTok. Not on TikTok. Maybe Twitter or something. That's surprising. Follow I would have thinking that you as a TikTok person. First yeah. Trust Portfolios. He's a CIO, COO. Been a wonderful resource and partner for us. If you are thinking about selling your stocks and panicking, listen to this podcast. Come back to Bullish. It's called Bullish. We are optimistic on the future of the economy and the U.S. stock market. So stay the course. Go follow us on YouTube, subscribe, like it, share it with your friends and family so you can keep getting more episodes like this. Thank you so much for being on.